Shalom, and welcome to Secrets Revealed, the Holy Bible. Today we're looking at Exodus chapter 24. There are 18 verses. Beginning in verse 1, we see the Tetragrammaton, yod heh vav -Hey, has been omitted uh, in the Masoretic text, right at the end of the verse, right there. Verse 3, and be obedient. And be obedient has been omitted. Uh, this is the people of Israel answering with one voice. We will do, which is included in NT, but be obedient is not. Verse 4, uh, the Septuagint uses mountain versus hill in the MT. As well, it says here stones. Set up 12 stones versus 12 pillars. Uh, this whole verse, or I should say the, the word whole has been omitted, not the whole verse. Whole burnt offering instead of uh, it just says burnt offerings there. Verse 6. Bowls. They poured it into bowls versus basins. The word poured, the blood be poured out upon the altar. You're going to see that's a uh, continual difference. Uh, I might have pointed it out in a previous video, but just to reiterate, normally when it does say sprinkled in the Masoretic text, about I'd say 95 probably 90% or nine times out of 10, when you see the word sprinkled in the Masoretic text, it actually means pour it out upon the altar. Pour it out is what it's actually meaning. That's the actual meaning. Verse seven, ears. The word ears, read it in the ears of the people versus read in the audience of the people. Uh, when you're speaking before people, obviously you're in their presence, but speaking it in their ears is another uh, meaning altogether, meaning they can hear what you're saying, not that they simply see you, they're actually listening to you. That's an important point. I'd say that's a significant difference. So I'll just put there sig dig, uh, diff, sig diff. I have a new format you'll notice of abbreviations. If you actually you can't see my notepad anyway, but uh, I've started to format things a little more uh, efficiently and simplistically. Verse 10, scrolling down, the difference here is the place where stood has been omitted. So this is an omission. Uh, the place. Um, how do I minimize this? The place where they, they saw the place where the Elohim of Israel stood. Uh, so they saw the Elohim of Israel. So this is a big, this is a big difference actually. Um, yeah, in actuality, this is a, I would say this is a huge difference. I'm gonna write here, huge diff. Because no man or woman has ever seen the father, specifically the father, and and lived. And they're saying here they saw the Elohim of Israel. No, they saw the place where he stood, not, not him himself, but they saw the place. Um, so that has not only been omitted, it is a large difference. So I'm going to write here verses uh, saw the Elohim of Israel, that's a big difference, a huge difference. And then we have the words here, slabs, sapphire slabs versus uh, stones. And the appearance of firmament, uh, purity, as it were, the appearance of the firmament of heaven and its purity. So these slabs, uh, were blue 
a sapphire blue color. Um, under the feet. So they saw the place where Elohim stood and it's under his feet. It looked like a work of sapphire slabs. It looked like the appearance of the firmament of heaven in its purity. Uh, on the other hand, we see here in the Masoretic text, under his feet were a paved work of sapphire stone and as it were the body of heaven this guy in cle clearness, so a clear sky. I would say they're similar sentiments regarding the appearance. Uh, sapphire stone versus slabs. I mean, yeah, slabs are larger. So moving on, verse 11. The whole first half is different. So let's read that. Of the chosen ones of Israel, there was not even one missing. Okay, not one missing. The Masoretic text says, oh, and they appeared in the place of Elohim. Okay, the chosen ones of Israel. Okay, so this sounds like the people of Israel. That's what it sounds like here. I don't know if you, I, if you can see me, but if I, if I minimize this, if I'm hid, anyhow. So it sounds like it's talking, referring to the people of Israel. Uh, we also notice the Masoretic text, upon the nobles of Israel, he laid not his hand. Who is he? This is probably talking about Elohim of Israel laying his hand on them. Why would he lay his hand on them? It doesn't make sense, but the, the Septuagint does make sense. There was not one missing. And they saw Elohim. Again, they didn't see him. Uh, they saw the place. They appeared in the place of Elohim. So they, they either were uh, where his feet were, or he was standing, the place where he was standing, but they didn't see him. They only could see that area, the blue firmament area, but they, if they saw him, they would probably be vaporized. They wouldn't survive. No man can see him and survive. So we know it is the place, not Elohim. Um, but who are these chosen ones is the question. Is it the nobles, like the Masoretic is implying? Or is it the elders? The chosen ones, the elders of Israel, the heads of households, or is it someone else? That's an interesting thing. Interesting question. Um, again, huge difference. Uh, they appeared in the place of God or Elohim. Uh, they didn't see God. Verse 12, so I, uh, it says here, and Yah said to Moshe, come up to me into the mountain and be there, and I'll give you tablets, the tablets of stone, tables of stone, pardon me, the law and the commandments, which I've written, to give them laws. Uh, so the feeling, how I read this is, so I, Moses, so I will give you this, which I have written, to give them laws. Okay, versus that you may teach them. Um, can I just pause here for a moment? Okay, so the Septuagint is saying, I have written these commandments to you, Moses, to give them laws. That's the purpose. Verses which I have written. I've written these commandments and that you may teach them. Okay, so uh, you may teach them. That could be separated from the laws. It could be anything. But in the Septuagint, it's very specific that these are the laws, the commandments. These are the things I've written to give them the laws. 
these are to be given as their code of conduct of of their constitution. But uh, in the see, this is very subtle. If you just read it very quickly and not really reflect on it and think about it, this will just go over most people's heads. But that's why we're doing this study. It's very uh, we have to get down into the word and really reflect on it. So what it's saying here is that you may teach them in the Masoretic text. I've written these and, you know, Moses, you can teach them. Teach them what? He didn't say specifically what. Uh, it leaves it a little more open to interpretation. Yes, it does just say a, a, just previous to that, uh, that you may teach them a law and commandments that you may teach them as in the people or teach them as in the commandments. That's why it's a little bit open to interpretation. So I'm gonna write here, is, is them referring to the people or the laws themselves? So that's a question that must be asked. But that question is not even a question. <laughs> it isn't even a question, the Septuagint. Verse 13, attendant, uh, Moshe rose up, rose up, and his, and Joshua, Yehoshua, his attendant. Uh, so he was there to help Moses. He was attending to him. He was old, but not that he was weak, but Joshua was helping him out. So he had a helper, an assistant. Uh, so I guess you can read it as assistant versus a minister. Uh, a lot of people, when they read the word minister, they think, okay, a minister, you know, a pastor. But it's actually talking about, you know, it's uh, somebody who's helping him a minister, ministering to him. So similar meanings, Ania, just pause it for a moment. Okay, so that's verse 13. Verse 14, rest. And uh, verses Terry. Um, so Rest there till we return to you. Uh, this is Moses talking to the elders. So rest versus tarry. Rest means obviously to uh, recuperate, to, to nap, to just uh, refresh yourself versus, uh, or it could mean stop versus tarry, which means to, to literally wait, just wait here. Not resting, not relaxing, rest. Uh, I'd say that's a significant difference. Uh, we have a major difference in verse 15. Why is this major? I'll tell you. Moses and Joshua went up to the mountain. Okay, so they went up to the mountain. Who? Moses and Joshua. And the cloud covered the mountain. Okay, Masoretic text. What say you? And Moses went up into the mount. Just Moses. Joshua didn't go. Why is this a big difference, a major difference? Well, not only is it because in the court of law, if you ask Moses who went with you, the Septuagint would say, Joshua went up with me up to the mountain. The Masoretic text would say, I just went up by myself. And that is just not the case. The reason why I labeled this a major difference, not a ma uh, not a big difference or a huge difference. Uh, major, I would say, is in between big and huge. So it's a major difference because the symbolism, as we know, of Joshua and Moses, Moses is like akin to, I'd say, the God the Father, Elohim the Father, versus, uh, on the other hand, I should say Joshua, Yehoshua is representative symbolically. Uh, you can see that symbolism or, or you can make the association that Joshua is like Jesus Christ. He's like the son in some ways. I know Aaron is usually uh, compared to Jesus, the word, Yehoshua. Uh, I'm just going to say Jesus Christ, not that uh, I can't say Yehoshua. Just going to say Jesus because more people know who Jesus is. But uh, anyway, you know, I'm referring to Yahushua HaMashiach in the Hebrew, just a little harder to say. So I'm going to say Jesus. Uh, 
so you have that kind of association or that symbolism, that allegory. You, you have Moses as the father and Joshua as the son. I know Aaron, again, is used as a type of Jesus Christ. But for the sake of this uh, verse and what's happening here, Joshua not only um, is very much similar to Jesus Christ, but you can see uh, once Moses uh, had died, Joshua was the one who took over for him. And I'm not saying that the father died. I'm saying that Joshua was really the conqueror, conquering the peoples of the land in his book and the account and the accounts in Joshua. And that's what Yehoshua HaMashiach, Jesus Christ, will be doing when he returns a second time, when he'll be conquering the nations, subduing them. So you can see that similar picture there. Um, I mean, Aaron, yes, is a high priest. He's, a, he's an intercessor. And so is Yehoshua HaMashiach as well. I was going to say Yehoshua. I mean, if you know I'm talking about the anointed, the Christ. Uh, but Joshua is the son of, of Nun. So uh, Joshua ben Nun, I guess. That, that's a big difference. Uh, to leave out Joshua, why would you do that? But they did. Anyhow, the last verse we're going to look at is... Uh, Verse 18, or 17 rather, it says, before the children of Israel. Uh, so this is the appearance of the glory of Yah was as a burning fire on the top of the mountain before the children of Israel. Um, and the sight of Yah was like a devouring fire on the top of the mount in the eyes. Okay, so. In the Septuagint, it, it isn't clear whether they saw Yah or not. It's kind of, uh, it, it might have just happened near to them or before them. But uh, in the Masoretic, it's very specific that, yeah, it was in their eyes. They saw it. Whereas uh, if they did really see his glory, perhaps they would have vap been vaporized. They, wouldn't have, they would not have survived. So that's why the Septuagint is much more safe uh, if you're saying, you know, it happened and it was before them, but they didn't see it with their eyes, but it, it happened um, in front of their, where they were. They just didn't see it for themselves. Uh, but perhaps they did because it says the sight of the glory of Yah was like a burning fire on the top of the mountain. It'd be hard not to see it. But maybe, uh, you know, the thing is, if you, if you really look, if you really analyze this uh, particular verse, it's saying the appearance of the glory of Yah. It's not the glory itself. It isn't Yah himself, but it's the appearance of. So it's like, here's my glory. Maybe it's like an outer shadow and then the appearance of the glory. So it could be like a shadow of the glory. It's, it's a little bit, you're further removed. But if you were directly, directly in front of, his glory, you'd be vanquished, you'd be van uh, vaporized. You wouldn't be able to survive that. Most everybody wouldn't, unless he's protecting you, shielding you. So uh, so it's like, you can see it's a little far removed. So I'm kind of leading to perhaps they did see it. It, it isn't 100% uh, without a shadow of a doubt that they we know that they did or did not see it. Okay, so uh, that's all I have to say for this uh, chapter. Uh, thank you for watching. Uh, may Yah bless you and make your way prosperous for Secrets Revealed. This is Jack Knight signing off. Mm -hmm.